and today I would like to talk about why I don't believe in the hadith. The hadith or a hadith to give it its plural is a large body of hearsay written down between a hundred and two hundred years after the time of the revelation of the Quran which according to Sunni Islam at least is um, part of the faith. Now there's a huge contradiction here on the one hand <coughs> the Quran is supposed to be complete and perfect and yet we are told by Sunni Islam that there is something else that you need to believe instead or as well well actually instead because when it comes right down to it the religion that we all know and love as Islam is based entirely upon hadith and I can demonstrate that the entire corpus of the premise of the religion of Islam as intoned by the main Sunni schools rests upon five so-called pillars. Nowhere in the Quran, nowhere is there mention of pillars of any kind as relates to a religion and certainly not five so there's no mention of this in the Quran. It comes from a hadith. The initiating declaration known as the Shahada uh, is nowhere found in the Quran. The Shahada <coughs> in Arabic is Ashahadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashahadu an Muhammadan Rasulullah, which uh, translates as I bear witness that there is no God but God, and I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of God. Nowhere is this statement found in the Quran. Nowhere. It doesn't exist. So the basis for this religion called Islam is the Hadith literature, and Hadith literature is what you need to believe to be a Muslim in the traditional or popular sense of the word. It's nothing to do with really believing the, in the Quran. The Quran is an, is an add-on. They make a big deal about the Quran, they talk about the Quran and they endlessly pour over it and read it and you know uh, sort of read it out loud using what is called tajweed uh, which is a form of uh, singing. But they don't actually read it to understand it. They believe that it can only be understood with reference to this huge, voluminous library of later hearsay. Now, I'm going to just summarize why I don't believe in this uh, second library of stuff. Uh, the first is, is that the Quran itself claims to be from God and it claims to be complete. Now, if this is true, there's no good reason to follow anything else. And if it's not true, then there's no good reason to follow the Quran. I certainly have no particular interest in a cultural narrative, the narrative called Islam. I didn't uh, wake up one day and think, oh yes, I must, you know, grow a long beard and start shouting Allahu Akbar at people and um, getting all hot and huffy if somebody hasn't got, you know, the right sort of clothes on walking down the street. No. What I'm interested in is the truth and I'm interested in what happens to me in this life and in the life to come. And it was through my investigations that I came to read the Quran and to realize that the Quran is from God, it is perfect, it is correct. It was only latterly that I really encountered the religion called Islam and I didn't begin by rejecting it. I listened to what it had to say, I studied it and then I rejected it because, well, from my point of view, it's nonsense. It's no more nonsense than the nonsense that I was brought up with. It's no more nonsense than the lemming, liberal, ludicrous rubbish that we were taught as children or are continue to be taught through the media. But it is nonsense. And the critics of Islam are quite correct in much of what they say. I'm not discussing that or defending it. I'm not even particularly interested in it. I'm interested in the book that these people have, the book that they frankly disregard. And whilst they would have you accept that in order to engage with this book that you have to accept this completely different body of literature created in my opinion by the 
Brzezinski's and Kissinger's of the day, frankly by Persians, and it's true that the compilers of the so-called Sahih um, compilations of, of, of Hadith were all Persian. This is a nation that was ancient even in the even in the 7th and 8th century the Persians were already ancient you don't get to be an ancient culture if you're not pretty good at real politic now the the Persians had been defeated by the Arabs and quite clearly the the Persian elite sat down and thought what went wrong guys and their analysis was correct we've been invaded by these people that and you must understand that the, the Persians regarded the Arabs as is inherently inferior. The Arabs prior to the Quran had nothing, not very much anyway, a bunch of disorganized tribes running around Arabia stabbing each other in the back, which frankly is what they've turned back into. The Persians on the other hand were highly sophisticated, extremely intelligent and had mastered the art of real politic and Clearly, what they did was they sat down and thought, how do we destroy this? Well, the question they clearly came to was, what's changed? And what's changed, what had changed, was these this disorganized rabble of infighting, tribalized, minor warlords had been given a revelation from God, which had concentrated the mind, disciplined the passions, and brought them into alignment with God's will for them. So how do you attack that? And how you attack it is quite clear. You corrupt the text if you can. That wasn't possible. The, the Muslims, the Arab Muslims, despite their many, many failings, and my goodness, <laughs> they failed. They did manage to preserve the text. They managed that much. And the, the Persians weren't able to attack it on that front. So what do you do? What you do is you co-op. This is what Paul did with Christianity. It's what uh, the media does with, with history, especially to do with the Second World War, but all history, in fact, and, and even current history, you know, current events. They, you own it, you, uh, you, you co-opt it, and you make it yours, and you lead it where you want it to go. This is standard operating procedure. There's nothing unusual in this. <coughs> this is what the Hadith did. Now, the way you do that is you leverage. You leverage... The average Muslims respect for the messenger. And this is how it's done. So when you say you don't accept the, the hadith, a Muslim doesn't hear those words. He hears this man disregards the Prophet Muhammad, and then he feels quite right and, and, and justified in attacking you. But he hasn't done his homework. And whilst that is something I've become used to both in my own culture and in the with my dealings with Islamic culture <clears throat> I have done my homework and the home, my homework shows me that the hadith literature which contains some good some bad and indifferent that shouldn't surprise us is all hearsay by definition it's hearsay Muslims won't disagree with you they know that it's hearsay but to them hearsay is acceptable so and so told so and so told so and so told so and so told so and so that the Prophet Muhammad said such and such. Maybe. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Who knows? Maybe it's a complete load of rubbish. Maybe it was just made up. Now, the method for establishing the um, admissibility of a particular hadith I reject in total. It's called a science. It's. <laughs> <laughs> well, just to illustrate how uh, unacceptable this is, I can say that I would never sign a contract to buy a second-hand fridge on this basis. And nor would you. And <laughs> nor would any mullah. And yet, we're expected to entrust our uh, eternal souls to this literature. Well, I won't do it. I have no pre-existing allegiance to... Uh, this nonsense and the Muslims aren't the first people to do this the Jews make the same mistake absolutely they assert that when Musa when Moses received the Torah 
that he received the like thereof. He received the oral Torah, the special Torah that only the, the Pharisees know about. Well, this is what, in effect, the Muslims are claiming, that, that God's revelation was not sufficient, that this is other revelation that you know nobody knows about, but that they knew about, and if you don't follow it, then somehow you're, you're lacking. Well, I think this is nonsense. I'm calling bullshit on this one. Nobody is contesting the idea that the Hadith is hearsay. The Muslims don't contest it, they can't, because by virtue of the of the of, of the of the genre, a hadith contains two components. It has the isnad, which is the supposed pedigree, and then it's the maton, which is the supposed actual thing that the, the Prophet was supposed to have said. Well, by definition, a hadith has this isnad, it has this chain of so-and-so told so-and-so, so told so-and-so. Would you accept that in a court of law? No, it's not evidence. So if it's not evidence, we reject it. Now, I'm not saying there aren't some good things in the hadith. There are some good things in the phone book. But that doesn't mean that I accept this as a basis for my religion or my soul. Another point, another reason why I reject the hadith in total is that at the root of what divides the two main sects of those groups that which today call themselves Islamic is their differing bodies of hadith. There's not just one body of hadith. There's lots of this stuff. And... Um, the Shia have one lot of it, which emphasize one lot of things. And the Sunnis have another lot, which emphasize some another lot of things. And I, I will admit, I haven't really read a lot of the Shia's uh, hadith, but I've read enough of the Sunni's hadith to know that I don't accept any of that. The if If these two groups are not able to agree among themselves about all of this stuff, then I don't see any real reason why I should accept any of it. Another point I would make is that the, the character uh, of Muhammad in the Qur'an is a completely different character to the, the character that we meet in the, in the Hadith. In the Hadith, uh, this character of Muhammad is, is fundamentally all-knowing. There's nothing this guy doesn't know. I mean, you can ask him anything. The day of judgment, this, he knows it all. He He's right there with the answers. You know, he knows the Mahdi, and the Mahdi, the, the so-called Mahdi, the so-called guided one. None of this is in the Quran. It's a completely different narrative. Now, if you want to know how to neutralize a people and make them indolent and to look for answers outside themselves and to to become passive you want a savior <laughs> and this is standard operating procedure you want a savior coming in from the outside nowhere in the quran is there any mention of a mahdi none the character of muhammad in the quran knows nothing about the day of judgment and he's told to say i know nothing about this he has no knowledge of it yet in the hadith completely different character in the, in the Qur'an, there's a very limited number of, of laws, of, of parameters, of principles, fundamentally. And we're told that it is, it is an, a wrong thing to make haram what God has not made haram, i.e. to make illegal that which God has not made illegal. Yet Muhammad, this character in the Hadith, it's all haram. This is haram. That's haram. Dogs are haram. Music's haram. You name it. If you can, if you can name it, you can be pretty sure some or all of it's haram. It's perhaps on differing days, but you know, there's a whole load of stuff here for uh, you know any sort of competent priesthood to get their get their fingers into and start making a living off. And you know, they have. So I don't accept it. I don't find it in the Quran. I think it's rubbish. The system by which the particular chain of narrators is supposed to be established and assessed in the Qur'an, well, it's complicated enough to keep you busy, but is there any truth to it? I severely doubt it. Um, and I'll just give you an example. Just one example of not so much to do with the so-called narrators, but to do where, with where the, the Qur'an and uh, the, the Hadith are completely at odds. <coughs> According to the Quran, the way the, the the Quran was written down in the time of the Prophet, it says it is written down on pure by you know by faithful scribes upon pure pages. It's a book. It calls itself a book. 
it regards itself as a book and written on pages, written on paper. Now the Hadith has a completely different uh, narrative as to how this thing was collated, which one which one which allows doubt, one which says that uh, Uthman did this and then he burnt that and then he didn't like this verse and then there were some lost verses. No, the Quran completely rejects this. It calls itself a book protected. Now you can accept one or you can accept the other, but you really can't have both. And I think that what happens when you try to have both and brand Islam requires you to have both is that you enter into sort of cognitive dissonance where you do know intellectually that these things, two things don't go. A bit like 9-11, you know that it can possibly have been, you know, 19 Arabs on a plane. And yet you've got the government telling you this thing. So what happens is it actually sends a wedge through your mental processes where you know that, the, that these two things are not reconcilable and yet you're being forced to reconcile the unreconcilable. And this is where you enter into the realms of what Orwell calls double think. This is what Islam, if with hadith, requires of you. You can't embrace it if you're not capable of double think. And this is why I think that Islam is so uh, actually has so much in common with with Western so-called democracy at this time, because you need to be able to practice double think to be able to believe either system. I mean, Western democracy, we are bombing, killing, destroying, you name it, we'll kill you. Uh, but we're doing it because we love you and because, you know, really, we, we're so compassionate. And so at some level, we all know that this is rubbish. Well, it's really very much the same with Hadith. <clears throat> A further reason why I don't believe the Hadith, I reject it in completely, is that had the Hadith been required, um, the, the Prophet would have ensured that. Now, there are obviously some hadith which claim that that the hadith uh, is um, is required. That shouldn't surprise us. But nothing in the Quran. What the Muslims do is they cite small parts of the Quran completely out of context. What the what the messenger gives you, take. What he forbids you, leave. They'll they'll claim, ah, oh, see now that that that's telling you that you've got to follow that you've got to follow this other stuff. Well, that verse is completely out of context. It's like saying it's like attacking the Bible by saying the Bible says that there is no God. Well, the Bible does say that there is no God, but if you put it into the context of the entire verse, it says the fool hath said in his heart there is no God, and then it continues. So the context is completely different. The Sunni Muslims will say, "Ah, oh, yes, but you see, you know, the Quran is the is, is 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 the book, but you know, this is the revelation. But but Muhammad, his job was to explain this to us. Well, nowhere does we really find this confirmed in the Quran. What we find in confirmed in the Quran is that it's God who guides. God either guides or he doesn't guide, and the Quran is guidance." And nowhere does it say, you, Muhammad, go around teaching something other than this Quran and expect people to follow you. In fact, the reverse is true. You should warn with this Quran. So, of course, Muhammad operated as a, a human being as well as a prophet. But the thing that he received from God as a messenger is what we have in the Quran. What he did as a human being... In so, you know, if there is anything of that in the hadith, and frankly, I don't know. Um, okay, well, that was his, you know that was his perception. The Quran claims to be a guidance. It claims to be complete. It claims that God will protect it, and also it claims that Muhammad will say on the day of judgment that his own people have disregarded it, have turned away from it. Now. I'm not saying what you should believe, but I'm telling you why I don't accept the hadith. I see no reason to. Frankly, I think it's a waste of time. The Muslims will also say, ah, but you can't understand the Quran without the hadith. When was the last time you tried? I have tried, and I've managed to do it. You've had, you know, 1,400 years to do this. How do you know if you've never tried? So basically what it boils down to is people not doing due diligence, not doing their 
full analysis and not doing what the Quran tells them to do, which is to consider the Quran with care. What they're doing is they're following in their father's footsteps, they're following what their fathers told them was true. And the Quran addresses this very clearly, as anybody who knows the Quran will know. That the Quran says, you know, but what if their fathers knew nothing? Well, I'm not saying that their fathers knew nothing. I'm saying that I've done my due diligence and I have found answers to my own satisfaction. I didn't require mullahs. In fact, I found mullahs and hadith and the religion of Islam a gatekeeper against the Quran. It was the biggest single hurdle to be overcome once I'd come to the Quran was to understand that if I was going to do any real research on the Quran, if I was really going to study it and give it the attention that it requires, I had to ignore the religion of Islam because frankly it was just getting in the way. That's why I don't believe in the Hadith. And I look at the results. I look at what has the religion of Islam really achieved in the world in the last, well, thousand years. I mean, of course, there were great scholars, etc., in, in, in Islam, but that was a thousand years ago, and, you know, life has moved on since then. I'm talking about now. Obviously, there are some decent people who do happen to believe Hadith. Well, okay, good. There are some decent people who believe all kinds of things. There are decent people who believe in Catholicism. But it doesn't mean that what they, they, are, what they believe is correct. And it certainly doesn't mean, and this is really my primary point, that what they believe, this, you know, let's say for example in Catholicism, is in any way reconcilable with the contents of the of their foundational scripture, or in this case, the Bible. The same holds true for the religion of Islam. The Quran does not describe a religion called Islam. Islam itself is simply a word which means submission, submission to God. Are you submitted to God? I think you know if you are. Ibrahim, Abraham in, in the Quran, is God tells him to submit. He says, I have submitted to the Lord of the worlds. He doesn't say, oh yeah, I've become a Sunni uh, Muslim of the m m whatever mother, and I, you know, I, I pray at these particular times and I hold my hands in this particular way. No, this is rubbish. And I think any intelligent person knows this. It's just we've been lacking people. Well, actually, we haven't. There are people who have always stood up and said this. But I'm explaining why I don't accept it. And I don't accept it. I really don't care if I'm the only person in the world that doesn't accept it. I don't. It's foolishness and obvious foolishness. And worse than being obvious foolishness, I grew up in a society which is obviously foolish. So, you know, Islam has no monopoly on stupidity, believe me. But it's particularly pernicious, obvious foolishness because it detracts from the Book of God. And it means that people judge the Book of God incorrectly and upon wrong evidence. It's a tragedy that God gave us this revelation and we have been denied access to it by people who have frankly don't follow it but claim monopoly rights over it. And that's another reason why I don't accept the Hadith. So I think I've covered all of that. As you can probably hear, it's quite a, a subject about which I feel quite strongly. I'm not going to in this, uh, in, in, on this channel, endlessly go over the question of hadith. I'm not that interested in it, but I am asked regularly to clarify my position on it. I hope I've done that. I've been talking completely um, extemporaneously. I, I don't really have notes. So if it's been hard to follow what I've been saying, I, I apologize. That's, that's uh, a failing in me. But I, I, I f hope that in the sort of cacophony of thoughts that I've put out, I've managed to hit most of the, the, key, the key points. That's really it for now. 